like to thank everyone for the opportunity to, to come down here to talk about some of this work. And the projects I'm going to talk about were done at the Pacific Agri-Food Research Center in uh, British Columbia. And there's a group of people who are at there or at Agassiz, including myself. And as well, we were able to draw in people who are working on soil carbon at our uh, research center in uh, Quebec. Um, and next slide. Now, where we come from, and, and you may want to go in a sequence there to get it all up. Uh, where we come from in British Columbia with respect to organics is from a minority position because in actual fact, about, uh, but a fair concentration, 13% of Canadian uh, organic farms are in British Columbia. But when it comes to tree fruits, about 7% of the apples and uh, about 2% of the sweet cherries and grapes are there. Prices have been, or acreage was increasing up to about 2008, the, uh, around the financial crisis, driven by consumers, uh, lifestyle issues, environmental concerns, maybe tapered off a little bit since that time. So next slide. What we did was establish an experimental organic block, and it was on Ambrosia on B9. It wouldn't have been our first choice, but at that time the growers were planting a lot of ambrosia so we couldn't get the mulling nine we wanted. Space at one by four meters, you can see the planting there. There's some unique things about that planting which have some implications, I think, to organic production. One is it's isolated and sur uh, surrounded by conventional production at that research site. The second thing is we've spent a lot of time working on very coarse, poor soils and trying to amend them to increase organic matter just for having healthier soils. But this one is actually a silt loam, which is one of our heavier soils. That's a little bit unusual. And the other thing was that about five years before we planted this, it had been a nursery site. So you can imagine fairly high inputs of nutrients went into that nursery. So special conditions. Irrigation system, of course, in the Pacific Northwest, we have to irrigate. You can see the drippers hung high. It's a little easier to see them when you've got mulches on the ground. And we also were a little worried about establishing the cover crop, so we have an overhead system, not so easy to see in that photo, which we used occasionally. It's a heavier soil, but if you don't do that, the center rows dry out. And of course, you could wonder, but well, maybe you need a, a drought-resistant cover crop, but of course, it's not going to quite have the same biomass characteristics as others. But those are some conditions that this site is under. So next slide. Uh, and uh, what we did is we managed it organically. So that meant we needed a lot of help by people in the insect and disease side. side and we, when that problem arose, we solved it organically. So during the time period I'm talking about, of course, we did hand thinning. Uh, dormant, we had some aphid problems. We used dormant oil. We had some predator release, ladybugs. I'm not sure if they just flew away home, but there you go. Safer soap. BT for some of Lepidoptera. We are under the umbrella of the SIR program in British Columbia. We have sterile insect release for the coddling moth. We use pheromone disruption, so not too bad a problem. Disease incidents, we had a little bit of an outbreak of mildew in 2007, so we used cumulus and reduced that to 2 to 3% levels in subsequent years. We had a fire, uh, break, uh, fire blight outbreak in 2007, which we aggressively pruned out. We lost one or two trees, uh, and we were monitoring continuously for both fire blight and, and, uh, no, and scab, apple scab, by computer models. We had conditions for scab, but no scab. And of course, we were in an area where the probably inoculum density is quite low. So our real con uh, concern, next slide, was of course, uh, to do uh, something you can do. It's a little hard to do these tests on disease and insects because you need such large areas, but with soil management, you can actually design a classic experiment. We had four treatments. You just want to click a few times there. And uh, they're what I called annual compost tillage, uh, alfalfa in situ, mow and blow. You probably saw some of that yesterday. Uh, wood bark. We have a lot of wood waste in British Columbia with a hay mulch over top and a black plastic mulch, and next, if you hit it again, it was a randomized replicated, six replicates, 10 tree plots. 
it's easy to do these things with the soil management. It's a lot harder to do that with insects and diseases. So next slide. One thing we are worried about is we are planting new, and it's easier to transit from an existing orchard because you can run off the nutrient reserves, especially nitrogen, but when you come with new trees, you're going into a situation where you can't use chemical fertilizers. So what we thought we would do to all treatments regardless was to apply a compost in a row. This is the one that's going to go under the black plastic here. It's going to be spread out over the, the width of that. Uh, and next slide, the compost we used uh, was this material which was generated at uh, the other park site, vegetation, uh, straw, aerated, turned uh, temperatures, a uh, little bit of fluctuation in nutrient content of, con of compost all the time. This is an average number. What we did each year was to measure the nutrient content and then calculate the application rate based on the nitrogen assuming 50 kilograms of N per hectare applied in uh, one meter on either side of the row there assuming a 30 percent nitrogen mineralization in the first year. There's lots of assumptions that go with these things but uh, the other thing we did is when you replant into old orchard soil you always have to be concerned about replant problems very difficult to deal with but what we did We've used phosphorus quite a bit at replanting time. We've also put in an equivalent of about 37 grams of phosphorus in a high phosphorus uh, compost that we found to try and help stimulate the growth and dilute the problems. I don't think we had replant problems, but next slide. A uh, little, little closer look at these, the compost tillage. We've had some negative effects of tilling uh, on damaging roots. We had a system here that was supposed to bounce off these trees, but of course with young trees it's not so easy because they're not very firmly anchored. So we had to convert to simply rototilling. The difference here was we were actually putting the compost on each time uh, that we did that. Next slide. And these pictures are a little distorted. It's actually about a, a two meter originally width of that treated area. Uh, but it tends to creep in over time in more like 1.8 meters. This is the alfalfa mulch grown in the row, cut three times a year and put back into the uh, row. Uh, and next slide. And when you do that, and we, of course, took, it takes a while to establish these things. So we really didn't get it going in the first year, which is 2006. It took until the second year. A lot of biomass production the first year settles down over time. You can see with the three cuts here, you potentially do add quite a few nutrients, total nutrients, N, P, and K. Of course, that's not all necessarily uh, available. Micronutrients tend to be rather low rates. Uh, the zinc is here. Next slide. Uh, here's the bark hay mulch after it's been established for a while. You can see underneath the underlay is a bark mulch, and then the hay mulch on top. Next slide. Uh, and we didn't really start this till 2008. If you look at those nutrient contents, they're remarkably similar. It was it's supposed to be a high, bio, what we thought would be a high biomass fescue, rye, alfalfa. You can see the proportions up there. But in actual fact, it's not, uh, alfalfa is a pretty high biomass. Now, there are some differences of timing of the nutrients because alfalfa really gets going very early and applies a lot of nutrients earlier than some of the, than this mixture here. But we are also worried that with this carbon input, uh, some of these things are fairly coarse, shouldn't be a problem, but you also have fines in there. So we actually came and fertigated with a fish fertilizer, which uh, it was a 522 and then a 320, to give an additional five grams of nitrogen per tree per year, fertigated one gram a week for five weeks. Uh, again, assuming it's all available. Uh, next slide. And of course, the plans, plastic landscape fabric, we had worked with that before and found that over time, when you stop the input of organics beneath black plastic, you have deterioration in the quality of the soil. So that was a reason for putting the uh, uh, compost even under this one. And uh, next slide. We, it also received, by the way, the fertigated uh, uh, NP, NP uh, fertilizer, uh, fish fertilizer. What are the overall results? Uh, the, this is uh, every uh, well, 
to every two years. I don't have the 2012 data there yet. It's still emerging, but uh, uh, really these are pretty vigorous trees as it turns out, maybe overly vigorous. Uh, not a lot of differences, although the bark mulch, uh, uh, the white bar treatment there by 2010 will bigger trees and uh, will pattern in 2011. Still the difference is starting to fade away a bit, but it's still bigger than the black uh, plastic. Next slide. Uh, and this is the yield. We had one problem with yield, uh, and this is a question I posed to all organic producers. What's the organic control for a black bear? Because he came and subsampled differentially the, uh, the treatments in 2008 and 9. Anybody thinking about what the answer to that is? The answer we came up with is an electric fence. So I don't know if that qualifies or not, but uh, in 2010 and 11, these are the yields, not, no difference really between all these treatments. And I would say these yields are low. Now the problem is this is B9, we're not sure, Ambrosium B9, maybe it's not a good compatibility, but we have a equivalent site, well not really equivalent, we had a site nearby on coarse textured soil which we really managed in a conventional way with high inputs. We had about twice the yield on those, the density is a little uh, closer. so. Uh, these are still, I would say, fairly low yield. Uh, some maybe over vigor, would be my thought. Very few effects of fruit quality. The one thing we did have in 2011, I put it up, I, it's, it's just a one thing time. We had uh, redder, firmer fruit, but on the tillage in 2011, but I think that was related to the less fruit on that uh, treatment in that particular year. I've, the yield is com uh, combined there for 2010-11. So really not a lot of quality effects, uh, although the bark mulch, 65% red, and those are just uh, uh, visual evaluations, firm, that's firm tech, of course. Uh, next slide. So the nutrition, uh, really the nutrition of all these blocks, you can see we put, put a lot of nutrients on there in our, in our own way organically. There really, there are a few numbers that fell outside our standard values, but one thing that did show up was a reduction in bark mulch, uh, leaf nitrogen for the first three years, you can see there. There are fines in that bark mulch, no matter how you think it's fairly coarse, so we suspected there was a little bit of tied up nitrogen, but still those numbers, even at 2.19, are not particularly, in the second you're not particularly low. Uh, and it faded out over time. Everything else you can see fell in a high, if adequate, the high adequate range. Next slide. The only other nutrients that were much different, and this was a bit of a puzzle to us, was the phosphorus. And I've got the comparison here between the bark mulch, two minutes to go, so I'm gonna I'll, uh, just show you a few other things. Uh, um, the bark mulch, the extremely high phosphorus in years two and three, maybe that was why the growth was a little better and the potassium differences there. So I'm gonna to go to the next slide. Um, the, there was more phosphorus. This is the zero to 10 centimeter layer, more phosphorus in the bark mulch. And next slide. Uh, intriguingly, there was also, uh, when you look at the phosphatase activity, it's a biochemical test, you can see it was also very high. There's in year six. We have samples in two years, zero, zero, two, four, and six. So. The transition there, timing is a very important issue. Next slide. Uh, I'm going to show you a little bit about the organic carbon and, and I won't go through all these slides, but uh, uh, you can see pretty impressive uh, performance here. Of course, it, we tried to get just at the surface layer. Of course, it's very hard over time to tell where the boundary is between the mulch and so on, but certainly the mulch has a really increased organic matter concentration. And I put two other samples below there, one of a conventional orchard nearby that's been in production for 15 years, and one of an unirrigated same soil series where it's been no, never, never farmed, it's under dry land conditions. So you can see that we certainly, have all those treatments that we certainly improved, it, especially with the mulches, how dramatically they came up. There's a difference also in the size of the organic material, what we call particulate is coarser material, some type of aggregation, and there's a lot of that under the bark mulch, and uh, the mineral soil uh, is, uh, that's the organic matter associated with a smaller fraction, so both were quite increased in the bark mulch. 
And next slide. That carbon to nitrogen ratio is a little higher under the bark moat, so there's some uh, permanent tie-up of carbon in there. And of course, you can see there's particles maybe in there. And so waste the time. I just want to show one last slide here. Next slide. Uh, aggregate stability, which is you get these by sieving these things under water to see how stable these particles are. But you can see all of these organic additions of compost and mulches increasing the aggregation in the uh, soil compared to the conventional, which we kind of destroy, and a lot less fines. And if you're a soil sampler, and we were out there taking samples, when you sample those in year six, the alfalfa and bark mulch is just like going into butter. So the structure is very good, and I tend to think that that's probably a good thing biologically. And we have other data on that, but I think at this point I'll leave that for later. So thank you very much for your attention.